This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Reed Pence. This week, doctors try to fend off false claims about COVID vaccines for kids. Misinformation creates a world where people don't know what to believe, so they believe nothing. All that and more when Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Nancy Benson, host of Radio Health Journal. If you enjoy listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. You don't have a mirror and you don't have face-to-face contact with other human beings, and so you forget how to even make normal facial expressions. The life-changing consequences of living in solitary confinement. Then... For some people, it's peanuts. For a different generation, it might be Calvin and Hobbes or the far side. For a different generation, it was Blondie or Steve Canyon or Terry and the Pirates. The rich history of American comics. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Viewpoints on your favorite radio station and subscribe and listen to shows anytime on Apple Podcasts and Google Play. COVID-19 vaccines have been developed, tested, and approved in record time, though the science on which they're based goes back to the 1990s. Record speed makes a lot of parents extremely frightened about getting the vaccine for their children now that they've been approved for kids all the way down to age five. But public health experts see that fast approval as a way out of the pandemic. We have a vaccine now that's widely available for just about everyone. Doctors are doing everything they can to fight off the misinformation swaying nervous parents. The bottom line is that we are facing an epidemic of misinformation around pediatric COVID-19 vaccines that will complicate the rollout of these vaccines across the country. The misinformation that we are seeing at the state level now is in many ways qualitatively different from what we've seen before. It's louder, it's more prevalent, and it spreads much more quickly. Dr. Nirav Shah is director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention and president of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. In effect, the misinformation around pediatric COVID-19 vaccines is like the Delta variant itself. It travels much more quickly, it's much more damaging, and most fundamentally, it threatens to undermine the progress that we've made to date. These lies have consequences. And it's kind of like what Mark Twain noted, a lie can spread halfway around the globe before the truth even has a chance to get its shoes on. Shah says misinformation leads people to distrust anything public health officials say, and that could hurt in the future as well as the present. It also creates decision paralysis among parents, making for an unnecessary wait-and-see approach. Well-intentioned parents who would have otherwise vaccinated their children may delay or decline vaccines outright, motivated in part or in whole by misinformation that they see oftentimes online. The misinformation also shifts the conversation away from answering honest, earnest questions about the benefits and potential risks of the vaccine to having to correct bad faith nonsense. Misinformation creates a world where people don't know what to believe, so they believe nothing. Dr. Stan Spinner agrees. He's chief medical officer and vice president of Texas Children's Pediatrics and Texas Children's Urgent Care. He says he finds himself constantly fighting off misinformation, claiming that the vaccine isn't safe or that it has massive side effects or that it doesn't work. We have incredibly strong, very sound data that the vaccine works extremely well in young children and that the safety is incredibly safe. We have hundreds of millions of doses given now to our adults in this country. We have tens of millions of doses given to our adolescents, and we have seen exceptionally small numbers of any type of consequences of concern. A lot of things have been put out there that are just simply not true. And in our trials for our 5 to 11-year-olds, we had incredible safety record and very good effectiveness. So all those put together, to me, as a parent now as a grandparent, 
And as a pediatrician, we would certainly advise our families to take advantage of this golden opportunity. Honestly, vaccines are the safest thing we do in medicine. They are safer than most over-the-counter medications. And we do things for our children every single day, like putting them in a car seat, knowing it's not perfect, but knowing that it is our best tool to protect our children. And looking at the risks of COVID-19 and the safety and efficacy of vaccines, this is our best way to protect our children. That's Dr. Ann Zink, Chief Medical Officer for the Alaska Department of Health and Social Services and President-elect of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. It reduces the chance that they'll become ill or sick. As a parent, when your child gets a fever and feels miserable, you will do anything to make them feel better. And this can help prevent them get sick. It helps to prevent them having the risk of long COVID. We see that children are at risk for this, and even healthy children can become hospitalized and quite ill from COVID. COVID is not a benign disease in children. To date, there have been nearly 2 million cases of COVID disease in children. There have been 8,300 hospitalizations. There have been 2,316 cases of multisystem inflammatory syndrome of children and 94 deaths. Dr. Jose Romero is secretary of the Arkansas Department of Health. In adults, and we are beginning to get more and more information on this in children, that there are long-term complications of COVID. That is the long COVID or long haul COVID as some call it. We know that in adults, this can be significant. And one study in the UK suggests that seven to eight percent of all children have symptoms that persist many, many months after the infection. And these impact on the child's ability to learn in school, participate in activities that allow them to interact socially and generally make the experience of being a child much, much less meaningful in the long run. We have seen since the summer with the Delta surge that many thousands of children have been hospitalized due to COVID infection. In Houston, a third of our hospitalized children ended up in the intensive care unit because they were that sick. So it is not a benign illness, which was commonly thought last year when kids were at home and everyone was masked and there was not much exposure. So even before school started, we saw that really change. Spinner says it also appears that more kids have been passing COVID among themselves at school than has been reported, at least in areas where mask use is low. Those kids then bring the virus home, where Zinc says it endangers especially vulnerable or unvaccinated others. It's clear now that children can efficiently transmit COVID-19. And there may be others in your family or your community who are at risk, including those less than five who cannot yet be vaccinated, elders, those who are immunocompromised. And again, the data has become clear. Children can transmit COVID-19, and the more people that have immunity in your household, the less transmission of COVID-19 there is. And so our kids are a part of our herd. They're a part of our family. They're a part of our community. And protecting them helps to also protect the larger community, which helps to support them as well. Our children need caregivers and siblings and grandparents and their loved ones and helps to be a part of that. One reason mistruths persist is that they often have a tiny bit of fact in them, just enough to make them hard to completely refute. For example, the allegation that COVID vaccines cause heart injuries in the young. There have been some cases of, it's called myocarditis or pericarditis. It's basically an inflammation of the heart muscle. And there have been some cases that have been reported that we believe are attributable to the vaccine. This is in our adolescent and young adult population, primarily in the male population, usually after the second dose. In these cases, again, these have been exceptionally rare cases. I mean, you know, a few cases per million. So we're talking about extremely small numbers. But in those cases, the symptoms have been generally very mild, usually transient, lasting a couple of days and managed easily at home with using something like, you know, ibuprofen. What's important to understand about myocarditis that viruses can cause myocarditis and they do cause myocarditis. And our COVID-19 virus certainly is no exception. And the chances of getting myocarditis from infection by COVID-19 are up to 30 times greater than getting it from the vaccine. And for those who have had myocarditis due to the infection, the cases often are much more severe, in some cases requiring hospitalization. Another piece of misinformation, Romero says, concerns what's called natural immunity and the claim that if you've already had COVID, you don't need a vaccination. Yes, the child may have had an infection in the past, but 
that infection, that quote, natural, end quote, infection, doesn't confer the same degree of immunity as vaccination does. We don't know how long that immunity will last and we don't know how high the titers are. So for those children, we think that it is very important that they continue to go through the immunization process so that their titers will boost because there will be a boost if they have been infected and will protect them. We're not encouraging parents to seek any of the antibody tests that are available. This is a decision that needs to be made without that. And again, our recommendation, my recommendation at this time is that if your child has had COVID in the past, that once they're over the COVID, then they should receive the full immunizing series for that age group. In some of the regions in Alaska, we do a lot of testing and we see kiddos who test positive two or three times with reinfection. So we know that one previous infection does not prevent you from getting reinfected. And we know from adult data that immunization after previous infection provides more protection than just that previous infection alone. And so it's for those reasons, continue to encourage parents to get vaccinated even if their child had had it. The last thing I would add is that as a clinician, I see a lot of kiddos who come in and their family thinks that they had COVID because COVID can look like a lot of other things. It can look like RSV, it can look like adenovirus. And so just because your kid had a cough or a fever, or runny nose, they may not have had COVID. So don't make the assumption that they had it as well. And so for both of those two reasons, families who previously either had COVID or thought they had COVID still encourage to consider vaccination in this age group. A recent CDC report quantifies the difference between natural immunity and the vaccine. Relying only on immunity from a previous COVID infection gives you a five times greater chance of contracting COVID again compared to having the vaccine. However, some people still claim they don't need a vaccine because of new medicines that lessen the impact of illness once you're infected. Spinner says those medicines are welcome, but they're not as good as prevention. These medicines, again, are not going to be approved for younger kids probably for quite a while. And my understanding is of at least one of them that it's approved for adults who have to have at least one underlying medical condition. And we know that a lot of very healthy people have been severely impacted by uh, COVID. And then in general, when you look at the history of medications, typically have a lot more side effects than any vaccine has ever had or will ever have. So when you put all that together, you still want to rely on prevention before worrying about trying to treat something once it's already there. All of this will mean something for the holidays. Now, children as young as five can be vaccinated. Dr. Laquanda Nesbitt, director of the District of Columbia Department of Health, says for those families, normal gatherings are within reach. We do know that it is okay for families to get together when people are fully vaccinated. Things are a little bit different uh, when you are mixing the vaccination status of individuals, and there are some additional layering strategies that we would recommend, and you need to take into consideration the health of the people who are going to be mixing. We always recommend that you take additional precautions if there are people who are at higher risk, especially if they're unvaccinated or immunocompromised, who are going to be part of that large family gathering. I think of uh, gatherings kind of like road trips. You can do things to prepare for it. So you may want to consider changing your behavior beforehand, minimizing your exposure, and adding things like testing prior to travel, after travel, and making sure that we don't gather when people are ill, even if you're having a little bit of runny nose or congestion, because we are seeing a lot of RSV, we're starting to see influenza. And so this is a time of year to make sure that we aren't getting together if we're ill and adding that additional layer. Gathering at the holidays is important for our social and emotional health. So the sooner we can safely go to grandma's house, the better. The means to do it are available. You can find out more about all of our guests through links on our website, radiohealthjournal.org. I'm Reed Pence. More than 80% of people say that vision is the most important sense. So why do about half of us skip our annual eye exam? Dr. Valerie Sheedy Pallone, optometrist and vice president of eye care solutions at VSP Vision Care, shares why you should book a comprehensive eye exam, even if your eyes feel fine. Comprehensive eye exams are more than just visual correction. They can also help detect signs of underlying chronic health conditions like diabetes, which show no obvious symptoms, especially in its early stages, which is why catching these diseases sooner with the help of an eye exam is so crucial. Your eye doctor can tell you more about your overall health than you may ever know. We do that by dilating your pupils or using non-invasive technology 
to look at the blood vessels in the back of your eye. VSP Vision Care is the only not-for-profit vision benefits company in the U.S. and has been a leader in health-focused vision care. Schedule a comprehensive eye exam with an eye doctor today. It's easy to find one near you at VSP.com. That's VSP.com. And that's Radio Health Journal for this week. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more. And check Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify for a library of past programs. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and information about our guests at RadioHealthJournal.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Radio Health Journal. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. Like many people, brain injury is pretty frustrating. So he experiences some more frustration and irritability and anger than he did in the past. How traumatic brain injuries can impact relationships. Then humanizing the ICU. I now really value that component of my being at the bedside with these people more than I do the procedures, the beeps and the buzzers. All that and more this week on Radio Health Journal.